Okay, let's try not to make this sound very whiny. Power creep. It exists in a lot of video games. Some of you might not know what power creep is, so allow me to educate you. Power creep is something that typically affects live service games, whereas the progression of the game continues to go forward, older characters get out scaled by newer characters that are made to be better to sell more units. This can take place in a number of different ways. Usually it just means that, oh, X character does X thing better than Y character, and there you go. That's all power creep is. And I bring it up because I've been playing a lot of gacha games recently. I'm currently in the middle of grinding for C6 Farina. I'm also playing Stall Rail, trying to catch up on all the content I missed. And I'm in the middle of clearing out all of Wuthering Wave's content, which I've already done, so now I'm just in the grinding point. And as I went back to Stall Rail, and tried to level up a lot of my units, I noticed something very, very quickly. Damn, Star Rail has really bad power creep. I don't follow the discourse in Star Rail because I don't watch any other gacha YouTubers ever because it's not my thing, so I don't know if other people are going to agree with me on that or not, but I feel like the power creep in Star Rail is really bad. However, it has a lot less to do with the characters than it does with the actual game mode itself, and I'll elaborate on that later. But first, I feel the need to draw some comparisons. For those of you that claim that Star Rail has no power creep whatsoever, you are 100% factually incorrect, and I will not tolerate the ignorance. You can't sit here and tell me that Avengerine is not just your pard power creep. Japard exists to cast these really powerful shields while also dealing damage, and a lot of damage at that for a shielder anyway, just by getting hit. His skill has the same power as a Japard burst, while Japard has to wait three days for his USDA shipping to finally give him a shield that'll break in one turn. Sela does really nice single target damage, but why would I ever bring Sela into combat when I would have to assemble a mono quantum team of four five stars, or three five stars, assuming you don't put Sparkle on there, just so that I could run into battle and do less damage than a Boot Hill who came out this update and does more damage single target with significantly less investment. For fuck's sake, his best team has two free characters on it. That uh, is in the form of Gallagher and, uh, you know, what's his name? Trailblazer? I don't know his actual name. I think it's Kalis or whatever. Oh my god, and don't even get me started on Gallagher. And Gallagher is a four-star who's basically just Luocha power creep. Yeah, he doesn't heal as much, but he heals just enough to actually be viable while also doing significantly more for the team in the form of damage and buffs. And that's without even getting into the DPSs. Blade, Jing Liu, and Imbibitor Lune all fought tooth and nail for one another to have a role in the meta. And granted, their roles are pretty different. Jing Liu exists to be a low investment DPS that you don't have to put a whole lot of work in for her to actually be viable. Blade does less damage than all of them, however, he damages and heals himself accordingly, so he's really tanky, so you don't really have to worry about him dying, which isn't really that big of a deal, because most of the time your healers are just gonna die before you anyway, or your supports. So who gives a shit if your DPS is still alive? When your supports die, you kind of lose a lot of your damage. And then Imbibitor Lune steals happiness from tomorrow to live it today in the form of stealing skill point. But that basically became a non-issue when Sparkle came out and just buffed the ever-living shit out of him. Once upon a time, I would have told you Jing Liu was the best DPS in the game, but now I don't really think so. I think it's probably Don Hung. And then Acheron rolled up and fucking violated the Geneva Conventions. You know how you want to have all your enemies be debuffed and your team be buffed? so that you can do the most damage? Yeah, well, Acheron just rewards you for doing that. Debuff the enemies to increase my damage so that I can do a lot of damage. Whoopee, what, what challenging content this is. As touched on previously, I heard some people make the argument that a lot of these characters are unique for a lot of teams. Like I said, a lot of people point to the fact that Blade is incredibly tanky, therefore he's viable. But at the end of the day, you're in a time-limited content mode. You need to be able to complete this version of MOC, and unfortunately, you're time-limited on how many turns you have. So am I going to bring in the character that does half as much damage as a Bibiter Lune? But he's incredibly tanky? No. I don't need to survive for 10 turns because I don't need to last 10 turns. But you know what? Even though I've ranted about the DPSs for a little bit, I'm gonna be 100% honest with you. I don't really give a fuck about the DPS power creep. Because here's the thing. At the end of the day, the DPS power creep only really affects the end-end in-game modes. It definitely does affect some of the overworld content. A lot of the newer enemies are incredibly tanky and have mechanics based around team comps that anybody who's new to the game will have access to. Or the teams are so incredibly expensive you won't be able to use them. For example, the dinosaurs that want you to have DOT teams, but the only good DOT teams have two fucking five stars on them. That are all limited time, by the way. But at the end of the day, I don't really care about that. Here's what I actually care about. As new, more powerful characters get released in Stall Rail, they are accordingly buffing the damage and the strength of every new enemy. 
That is the main problem. Go back to the first area at the very beginning of the game. You will find that you are one-shotting shit with your skills. The enemies there are so much weaker because the characters of that era were significantly less powerful. As the eras go on and the new more powerful characters get released, they have to buff the enemies accordingly in order to make the game actually interesting to play through. It's not fun if you're just one-shotting everything as you go through the game. So a lot of older players will say that there's no problem because they don't experience the difficulty curve because as they go through the game, they're doing relatively the same amount of damage. But let me tell you, as a new player that just went through the whole game about two or three months ago with my fucking Sela that I got when the game first came out and didn't touch it for about eight months, it was some of the biggest crock of bullshit I've ever played through. Pretty much every enemy I went up against was taking no damage and dealing a ton of damage, and this didn't happen just out of the blue. It came a real issue by the time I got to the Imbibler Lune portion of the game. You know, the part where he splits the Red Sea like Moses. Once I got there, a ton of enemies were just straight up one-shotting me. By the time I got to Pentacony, it got significantly worse. Because the enemies aren't just buffed to match the damage of your DPSs, they're also buffed to match the DPS of the sustains. For example, if I'm going into Pentacony with nothing but my Natasha, I'm not going to be able to outheal the damage that these enemies do to me, because Natasha wasn't created to survive that. Natasha was balanced around the damage that older enemies did in the first region of the game. Therefore, she cannot realistically keep up with the damage that they are doing in Pentacony. So how would I, a new player, get around this? Well, naturally, you need to go get Lynx. But you can't go get Lynx, because Lynx is significantly harder to grind for because you need two teams. And I'm new to the game, so how do I get two teams? Well, you don't. You just don't continue the story. It took me about two weeks of logging in and grinding my accounts so that I was able to actually get through in pure fiction and get links, and at which point I had to slot two healers on my team just so I had enough healing to realistically get through the normal enemies that you would fight as you go through Pentacony. And let me tell you, that shit was not fun. Every battle took about 20 minutes. Even though I had two healers, there were times where I just straight up died, and I was unable to grind a lot of the materials I needed because normal enemies were kicking my ass. As it currently stands, the enemies are outscaling the pace at which a new player can progress through the content, and that's not good. At the end of the day, most of the standard 5-star characters are considered not very viable anymore. Pretty much all of them have received some form of direct power creep in one way or another. I mean, for fuck's sake, Avengerine is basically just Clara and Drapard slapped together. Luocha does more healing than Bailu, and if you have Fu Xuan, then you don't even need either of them as she's going to be able to sustain the team by herself. Don't even get me started on how bad the DPSs in there are. I don't think Yang Chen was even good when the game came out. He's definitely not good now. The only two characters I can see somebody making a case for is Branya and maybe Himiko. And I guess if you are not very invested in a ratio team, then maybe well. So anybody who starts the game now and progresses through the content is basically going to be fucked. There's not going to be any real DPSs they can get. If a high power sustain is not currently available on the banner, then the only thing you can do is wait. And I speak from experience, because as I was going through the story, I really needed to sustain. I really needed some support for my team, and I didn't have any. So for roughly a month, all I did was bang my goddamn head against the wall, hoping to god that maybe, maybe next banner will be a Luocha banner. And thank god that actually did happen, and then Avenger In came out, and then Gallagher came out, and now they're he's kind of not really that good anymore for my account, but I don't want to talk about that, because I did get him in 10 pulls. One way or another, you get the point. It's not really so much a problem problem that DPS is outscale DPS. The problem is sustains are outscaling sustain. So in order to make it to where every content in the game you're just invincible if you have Avengerine, they have to increase the damage of later characters. Which makes it to where if you don't have later sustains or DPS to just straight up one shot at everything, you are going to get absolutely fucked up as go you go through the main story. A few primary examples are the big ass beetle boss that'll just straight up one shot you, or I don't know, maybe Avengerine's boss where if you don't meet his gamble he also straight up one shots you if you don't have good sustains. How about Sunday, who just does a metric fuck ton of damage with his touching hands attack? I have people on my friends list with E6 characters. I'll drag them in with my Avengerine and still get killed by that fucking boss. It's getting to the point where the outscaling of enemies is getting pretty fucking ridiculous. Thank god some of the bosses they release have gimmicks that actually require you to think and they don't just have a gimmick that equates to, yeah, either do this or die. The meme is a really great example of a boss who has a gimmick that doesn't just outright kill you if you don't do XYZ. Sam is another great example who requires you to have a shield and if you do have a shield you basically just win. Gimmicks like these help balance out the bosses that come out that just are incredibly overpowered to meet the scaling of a new character. And speaking of characters, god, there are so many fucking characters in Star Rail. Pretty much every issue I named in this video, I guarantee you one of you out there thought, oh, well, if you have X character, then Y problem is no longer an issue. And you're right. 
having a character in this game can take something that could be impossible and makes it possible because you have the puzzle pieces to fill out the slots. So if you get the character that counters the content you're currently struggling with, then you automatically win. But Star Rail kind of releases a ton of fucking characters. To put it in perspective, Genshin, which I know a lot of Star Rail players hate it when I make the Genshin comparison, but for fuck's sake, they're, they're made by the same goddamn company. Genshin came out literally almost four years ago. We have 81 characters in the game. Star Rail came out a year ago. We have 61 characters in the game. Do you see the problem? The pace in which Star Rail characters are coming out is insane. It is going to get to the point where you are going to need a specific character to fill out the puzzle piece in order to progress the content. You are going to have to wait god knows how long for it to run. Now, I used to play Honkai Impact 3rd, so I have a feeling I know what they're going to do about this. But I hope to god that's not something they go about doing, because having seven characters running at a time is just... A nightmare, and it's not something I don't think any of you want to deal with. Oh man, you waited one and a half years for the character you wanted to rerun? Aw, uh, that's unfortunate, because he's also running with another two characters you waited one and a half years for them to rerun with. You don't have any time to save anymore. And yeah, Star Rail may be generous, but it's not give you two five stars a patch generous. But yeah, that's, that's really about it. If you didn't take anything else away from this video, then I guess I should clarify here at the very end so you understand what I'm talking about. The power creep on characters in Star Rail is pretty bad, but I don't particularly care about it, because I feel like... In 99% of scenarios, any character can beat most of the difficult content, and even if you can't beat MOC, then what, will you lose to half of a pool? Oh no. The problem I really have is that because of the power creep, because of the new characters being stronger, because of the new sustain just shielding you from all of life's troubles, the new enemies that come out in the regular story content are much more difficult to the point where new players like myself and others are unable to actually get through a lot of the content. Normal enemies are dealing more damage than bosses. I am unable to grind certain relic domains because the enemies just kill me too fast. I know a lot of you say, oh, we'll just be relying on supports, but supports don't fucking help you through story. They only help you in relic grinds. And I'm sorry to the one fucking guy in my comment section last time I talked about this that said, just wait till this guy figures out about, about supports. Fuck you, you're exactly who Acheron's talking about when she weeps for the retarded. Just wait till you figure out you can't actually progress through story against the big ass bug boss because you can't bring in supports. You go in that shit raw, no rubber with your own fucking characters. Looking at you too, Avengerine, with your goddamn bullshit ass one shot mechanics. What? Oh, you lost the gamble. You didn't roll a six. Well, time to die. It's like, man, fuck you. <laughs> and well, that's about it. Uh, I'm done. That's about 10 minutes of whining now. So if you like the video, like it. If you dislike it, dislike it. If you're like me, go and subscribe. i been having fun with Star Rail, but fuck me, man. Like, shit. See you on the next video. Stay safe and peace, peace.